Hello and welcome to another edition of DIY uh, Indie Musicians Talking Music. Uh, today, I'm uh, really privileged to be talking to one of the busiest men. I bus busiest men. Bu well, busiest men I know in music. Uh, Mark, you sent me some stuff. We're going to talk about all of it, but begin with let, let's begin with um, the Star Crumbles, which is your latest project, uh, and you released a single this past spring, right? You said around May. Uh, yeah, yeah, desperately wanting. So, why don't we why don't we start there, and then we'll we'll talk about all the other things you're doing these days. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, my friend Brian Lambert, who I met on Twitter, mm -hmm. he lives in Denton, Texas. I live in Philadelphia, okay. and he had just finished a 52 week song challenge, where you know he just re wrote, recorded, released a song every week for a year. Wow. And since it seemed 52 like two weeks, that's crazy. It was. It was. I. I I can't even wrap my mind around it, honestly. And uh, I just, I just thought, hey, here's a guy who can get things done, and I love, I love his singing voice. I love his approach to recording. Yeah. So, um, and we had actually worked. I helped him out with a song. I don't know, a little earlier in the year called Kids. Right. And so I just reached out and I said, hey, let's. Any interest in doing a song? I sent him this track. The next day, he came back with vocals top line melody, lyrics. I loved it. It was perfect. And so then I was just like, hey, want to do something on a more permanent basis and turn it into a band? And that's that's where the Star Crumbles came from. No, great. No, that's, uh, it's a very, let's say it's a very common occurrence these days. Mm -hmm, definitely. Uh, just with the way things way things are mostly, I think, accelerated uh, by by all of the lockdowns um, and music. It's 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 interesting uh, because I, I think we probably arrived on Twitter around the same time. Mm -hmm. And unlike almost any other part of the Internet, what I've noticed with with at least music Twitter is that it's all about connections Mm -hmm. and helping each other and it's, it's one of the reasons why i started this show as well right oh definitely um you know and and actually it's a segue into one of the other things you've you've been doing once you started the band and i, I have no idea where you're getting all the energy are you like unemployed or something or or, 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 or like or <laughs> well, a trust uh, fund, a trust, a fund? Teacher, trust fund so i mean I've there's some old to... money in philly i think right what's that <laughs> i said there's some old money hanging around in Philly, I'd imagine. Oh wow, yeah, no. Well, you know, yeah. they you know what they say about Philly. Bad things happen here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, <laughs> I'm a teacher, so I've actually okay. had the summer off. Ah. And no, that, that, in that's, fact, no. I go back to work next week. So I've I've been right. trying to get I do a lot of interviews on my blog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so, how, so I've been trying to get as many in as possible so that I can have them kind of scheduled for at least a, a month or so going into the the new school year. Yeah, no, I, I understand completely. I try to do the same thing with this show in mm -hmm. case you get into like a real crunch where you have absolutely no time because everyone's got a day job, right? Yes. I, I think that's that's part and parcel of the the joy of being in, you know, in indie music. Mm -hmm. But but it's interesting because your second thing that you're doing is your blog. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what, what's interesting there is your latest article that you sent me uh, which is specifically about your experience, right? And, and sort of looking at a bigger picture about it, uh, you know, and you came up with the, the term tweet core, although I, I take issue with that because I think the, the scene might be better if it's like called tweet tone, like reggaeton. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, I mean, I think uh, I like, I like tweet core because I like the, the T followed with the C. Yeah. Well, I mean, my, my big, my big beef with it would be, it's a little overdone, like Watergate, you know, like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Gate. Everything. Well, if, it's, if it's a scandal, everything's a gate. Mm -hmm. And if it's some form of a music, it's a core. Yeah. 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 You know, it's like hardcore, it's this core, it's that core. You know, how many cores can there be? Right. You know, that's true. You know, it, it, listen, if the sun had that many cores, the universe would be, you know, long gone. <laughs> I, I suppose so. That's but you know, anyway. I never looked at it that way. Yeah, there there can be only one. But mm. no, no. Let, let's talk about the article a little bit and about your blog in in general. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the article. 
I had been meaning to write it for a while. It's um, I, I just really felt like when I was looking for a community, I found one and I found it what is arguably in the least likely of places, which is to say Twitter. Everything you hear about Twitter is it's a cesspool and, and it's partisan and everyone hates each other and it's bickering. And I have not found that to be the case mm -hmm. at all. And I don't know if it's an algorithm that's just saying, hey, this user is is simply looking up music and just talking about music. So we're not going to shove a bunch of, of anger in his face. Mm -hmm. But all I have found really is that all the musicians I've met, everyone I've talked to is extremely eager, not only just to talk about music generally, but to share other musicians' music. I mean, there's a generosity there that I think yeah. really inspires me. Mm -hmm. And that's what led me to write this essay, just kind of explaining, hey, here's how I got into music. Here's how I got into using Twitter. Here are some of the people I've met. Here are some of the cool collaborations that have come out of it. I mean, really, really, I think you you may have been alluding to it earlier, just the idea that people work together. I mean, and, and I'm sure you're right. I'm sure the um, that that COVID and lockdowns had a lot to do with accelerating that. Yes. But at the same time, it's living when we do now and having the technology that we have has really opened a lot of doors that otherwise wouldn't be there. Yeah, well, I, I think I think what's interesting or most interesting is, and I think it's what's most significant as well. Not now that you've you know you mentioned it, and it definitely came you know I came across the idea with the article or it provoked it. Is that at this point one of the biggest advantages of all this online is for musicians because we're able to leverage a lot of stuff that would be difficult otherwise with how just how fragmented music has become right mm -hmm. oh yeah but but you can find people that you know you can do interesting things with online much more easily because it could be anywhere in the world and it doesn't matter like I, I'm, I'm in a project, and my guitarist is in California, so it's exactly you know the yeah. same, the same thing. But you make it work, right? Mm -hmm. And I love doing collabs with people. I mean, as long as you don't mind like pestering them to get to get them to bring in stuff. <laughs> oh, know? sure, sure. <laughs> but but as long as long as you don't have a problem with you know doing something like that, it's absolutely great, and it really helps. Um, it helps broaden your music. Mm -hmm. as well you know you know what i mean and it gets you it gets us all out of the basement a little bit more yeah 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 definitely <laughs> i mean i definitely out of the basement and into the garage right yeah maybe into the garage maybe down the uh actually i went uh to see a couple of uh the, the bands that i really like one is called uh, a guy called scoopski okay he's, uh he's a philadelphia guy really right. really entertaining and then i found out that he was opening for a guy from chicago called phil yates also great stuff. And they were playing at a bar two miles from my house. So it was perfect. walking distance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I didn't walk, but I yeah. could have. And, yeah. um, but then, you know, and then I get there and there's this other band there called Bees and they're amazing too, you know? Yeah. So it's the kind of thing where uh, the, the virtual world and the real world kind of start to overlap with each other. And that's another great synergy that happens when you, you allow uh, when when you allow yourself to broaden the definition of scene. Mm -hmm. So now we talked about two things and why you're so busy. So you got the band you just started. Mm -hmm. um, you you're doing the writing stuff right with your blog. Yeah. Um, and the third one though is you went to the trouble of doing a mockumentary on how the band started with I don't know how many interviews. Uh, and, and where did you get the time to do that? That was funny. Uh, well, the whole thing started when Brian and I were, Brian came up from Texas to visit family in Delaware. Mm -hmm. And then while he was in Delaware, he figured, come on up to the Philadelphia area. We went down into old city. We went down to some of the historic sites. Yeah. And when we were on the train, he had this idea, Hey, what if we did something where we, you know, came up with this overarching narrative about where the band came from. 
Yeah. And then that's when I said, what if we just made this documentary? Mm -hmm. And he loved the idea. And then we just started reaching out and knowing, again, knowing that we are part of this incredibly, incredibly generous and talented pool of people in this virtual scene. Yeah. We realized that like we could just we could just email people and say, hey, here's the basic premise. Here are some questions. We've all seen the documentaries. We've all yeah, seen yeah, the behind yeah. the music style documentaries, right? Where it's, uh, you know, it's people who aren't quite in the band and maybe there are two people removed from actually being in the band and they're commenting, oh, yeah, I was there, I saw this yeah, show. Yeah. We've all seen it. So all you have often, to do- Often, yeah. frequently. I, I watch every one of those videos I can find. <laughs> oh my God, I, I'll, I'll spend a whole day watching them. And I love it when they contradict each other or even yes. better- when when like some musical personality contradicts himself in interviews oh yeah yeah and tells different stories and it's sort of mm -hmm. like it's huh, i wonder what the real story is yeah yeah but, yeah uh, yeah yeah and we found um so many i mean the people who we reached out to were a, a good mix of people you know there yeah. were a lot of musicians you know like yeah. um this guy mike mosley we know chris triggs of the band la la let's a wonderful musician from I think Tasmania. Yeah. Um, her name's. I love, I love the guy who was your manager, your former manager. Oh uh, yeah, so we had um, <laughs> Jeffrey uh, Brower. Jeffrey Brower. I mean, he was great too. He's he's such a character. And yeah, then well, he hammed it up. What's you that? Know, he re he really got into the role and hammed it up. Oh God. Uh, oh, I mean, a few, a few of oh, them. Maybe did. you're thinking of. Uh, there's also Greg Dorchak who plays. Uh, this one fella who is just like, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, who tried to break into a place, found it was a biker bar, and you guys were playing at it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. that's Jeffrey. He's good. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was that was a, that that was one of the funnier ones. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, he's you a, have to I, I tell really me what happened him. at the incident. You know, at the uh, the infamous uh, incident at the Elk Center. Oh yeah, yeah. The uh, well, like, yeah, how, how did how did you survive that, that show? Happened. What's that? I said, how did you survive that show? Oh, uh, well, I mean, a lot of times you're just fortunate to have uh, good people at the door, you know, okay. and a lot of times yeah. it's just a matter of knowing where the exits are. Yeah, well, it, true enough. And and it seems like the Doobie Brothers, you guys were like, a, you know, a, a biker approved band. And, and that, that definitely helps, you know. Yeah, people, I mean, that always helps. Don't don't mess with the bands that the, the bikers like. Exactly. It's not a good idea. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway so so musically i was uh, listening to your at the moment very very uh, scant um material so from mm -hmm. from what i you know what what i saw you've released two songs uh one one soul one on spotify so hopefully the album is coming soon uh mm -hmm. and then you've you've released two things on youtube as well Correct. and i have to say from the sound it was very uh it reminded me a lot of post-punk, um, you know, specifically there were, there was some echo in the bunny men. I heard a little bit, uh, mm -hmm. teardrop explodes, although you're definitely less psychedelic and more pop, mm -hmm. uh, or a very early cure. Yes. Before they got too, too depressing, <laughs> like, you know, sort of a forest period of the cure, like the, mm -hmm. the early stuff, a little bit sort of early new order. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, definitely. It's uh, my my right in my wheelhouse. Oh great. So, so great. what yeah. what what influence? Which which of those bands in that period influenced you the most? Because it was such a prolific period for music, and there were so many small little indie labels in in you know in England and around the world, right? Uh, oh yeah, that, that it was you know it was it was really interesting. So so who who would you say were like your biggest influences from that? Uh, I would say of of. Those that you mentioned, definitely uh, The Cure. Mm -hmm. Brian and I are both huge New Order fans. And yeah. then I would also then say Joy Division is in there as well. Uh, and definitely Echo and the Bunny Men. I mm -hmm. think we're, we're really kind of trying to focus in on that, that like you're saying, that whole that post-punk yeah. vibe. Yeah. And we actually, mentioning The Cure, one of our songs is called Trees in a Forest. Which is uh, oh, yeah, 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 very uh, kind of pure esque, yeah. even even in its title. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I, so I wasn't imagining things then. Oh no, not at all. <laughs> and, and so, so what? Uh, what other bands interested you from the period? And, and I, I guess other influences. Because I'll say my influences are all over the place, right? Musically. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, ours are definitely all over the place. You know, we're we're kind of going in uh, for this this specific project, really kind of feeling that early '80s post punk slash new wave slash even a little bit new romantic uh, mm -hmm. kind of feel. Yeah. Um, I mean, bands that always influenced me from the '80s, at least, kind of in the back of my head, I could have a little even a little bit of REM when I was mm -hmm. working on the music, um, but anything with kind of like a, a driving beat as well, you know, something yeah. like the human league was in there. Um, or even, you know, we, we, when the, the album is going to be out on September 22nd. Okay. And it's called the ghost of dancing slow. Mm -hmm. nice and title. so part of what we're doing is encapsulating a, a somewhat wide range of musical styles from the early 1980s. So we have a couple of songs that sound a little bit like um, um, oh, that song, Putting on the Ritz, you know, not not like um, show tunesy, but it just in the sense of almost um, a, um, the, the effect on the vocal has this old tiny yeah. radio sound, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so really, we're just thinking back to when we were, I think, first listening to the radio, yep. you know, when we're eight or nine years old and you just start hearing the sound that's not what our parents necessarily used to listen to, you know, and you're just starting to hear, oh, wow, hey, that's that's a neat noise that I've never heard a sound like that before. Yeah and trying to recapture a bit of that in what we're doing. No, and, and definitely it was a period where that was getting played on the radio. Mm -hmm. uh, although it was, it was you know, controversial sometimes. And, and people listened to the radio, which is something I don't know if people even do anymore. Yeah, I was uh, wondering about that. Yeah, but uh, no, I, I know exactly that feeling. For me, it was, I can remember exactly where I was when I heard Rock Lobster for the first time. Right, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. that and that organ sound, that really aggressive. Uh, yeah. Although, I mean, it's hard to say with the B fifty twos because they were just off on their own tangent mm -hmm. from anything else. That that's any you know, it was just a thing. Yeah. Uh, but but that definitely set things off. I think that and Devo, um, their cover of Satisfaction. Oh sure, sure. Like that or a deconstruction of it. Is probably right. a more apt way of you know, of a way of looking at it, and, and then and then it opened the gates to the punk stuff, where it was sort of all the same period because they definitely weren't playing the Sex Pistols, uh, or the Clash until very late. Well, that was until MTV, basically, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But a lot of the you know the the poppier end of the new way the, the sort of new wave stuff came through, uh, you know. Oh yeah, definitely in yeah. Philadelphia it was. Uh... WCAU 98 FM hot hits. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And so, so what, uh, I'm trying to think what other influences would, would there have been? I, I see uh, you wearing a Nirvana t-shirt. So I, yeah, I mean, yeah. they, say, they say about everyone that uh, the music that you like the most or relate to the most is the music that you like when you're 17 years old. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I think that's fair to a degree. I mean, but I mean, I remember being, you know, four and, you know, my, my mom got my dad, the white album on, on cassette for his mm -hmm. birthday. Yeah. And we just, that was always on in the car, okay. you know, wherever we went, that was, yeah. it was almost like the tape got stuck in there or something. Cause that's well, a good thing. It was a double album. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and, uh, we, we mainly stuck with disc one though, um, okay. largely yeah, yeah. for, uh, or not disc, but, uh, tape cassette one yeah. um so i knew all i mean to me those songs were are just basically just imprinted into my psyche you know yeah. so I, I always feel like i have this this very uh fond soft spot for the beatles you know no matter what um and so you know a lot of a lot of older tunes like that i mean i love all the music of the the 1960s huge fan of that even going further back, like rock and roll of the 1950s really inspires me as well. I think anything where people were trying to do something new or different, 
Uh, but if we do want to get, you know, towards, you know, when I was about 17, yeah, I mean, that's when I kind of really started being aware of, of punk and post-punk, you know, yeah. like you're saying, Sex Pistols, Clash, um, and then stuff like New Order and Joy Division and even, say, The Smiths or something like that, yeah. which I loved. And then by the time I was, I guess, I was probably about 18 when Nirvana hit. Um, maybe possibly a little older, but but about that time. And then once all those bands started breaking in the '90s, that was that was just kind of like, yeah, now is the best time to be just of the age where I can start going to clubs, seeing bands, playing music myself in bands. That was awesome. Yeah, no, I think I think it was definitely you were that was a good period. Uh, you, you know, just in terms of the type of bands and the type of music. And it was also everyone had their own sound. Yeah. It wasn't everyone sounding the same like with the hair metal bands, where it's right. pretty, yeah, pretty yeah. difficult to tell one from the other, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just, uh, you know, more personality, even though, you know, in some degree it was less. No, I, I it's funny, you know, another, another one like that for me was, uh, well, Soundgarden, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Pearl Jam. Yeah, sure. Definitely. You know. I really like that first record. That's oh, got yeah. really yeah. good songs on it. But you could almost hear the the straight through from REM to them. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, you especially get Especially the early REM and, you know, that channeling, that emotional, which for some reason for me musically, I I, I find I'm attracted to, mm -hmm. you know. I guess it's, you know, I, I almost became an actor. So I guess there's... Oh, no okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there is that sense of uh, narrative exactly. to it. I, did, I, didn't go, I didn't go as far to study, you know, to, be, to become like a mime performer like Kate Bush or David Bowie, but... Oh, okay. You know, I thought about it. Okay. <laughs> so in, ter in terms of the band, from, from what I could uh, see from the videos, so you, you play guitar mm -hmm. and drums as well. Yes. And I, I'm assuming I couldn't tell because it was just hands and you'd have to show me yours, uh, the bass as well. I, okay, uh, we, I do. No, I played. So, yeah, actually, basically, I played. The way it worked was I would record a piece of music and send yep. it off to Brian. Mm -hmm. And so it was uh, I would play mostly everything. And then he yep. would add some, uh, like, say, a synth line or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then Brian uh, would also add the vocal and the lyrics. So it's it was almost like, um, I don't know, Johnny Marr, Morrissey kind of uh, yeah. a collaboration, something along mm -hmm. those lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and do you, do you sing as well? or uh... I do sing. You know, I mean, I've put out a lot of music under my own name and with other bands where I've been the singer. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I really liked about this was not having to worry about that. <laughs> um, I think I, I'm best described as a reluctant singer, you know, and so I've written a lot of tracks and then I'll have, I've been in the situation before where I have say five or six backing tracks for songs. Yeah. And finally I just decide, okay, I guess I ha a have to write some lyrics for this, which is to some extent like pulling teeth. And then it's, oh man, now I have to sing it. And, and that's even worse because it's, ah, I don't like how that, okay, let me do a retake. And I think now that we have all this, it's, it's like a double-edged sword now that we have all this technology because it's, all right, before, if I had to rent studio time, I'd say I have a couple of hours in which to get this done. Yeah. Now it's in my basement. I could be down there. Okay, I didn't like that take. Let's, it could be a little bit better. It could be a little bit better and just keep experimenting until it just, the goal just keeps getting further and further away. Uh huh. Yeah, it, it's really the biggest danger. Uh, but the same thing can happen if you build your own studio. Yeah. You know, which, which I, which I did with a, a few other people years ago. Uh, and it was the same thing, you know, because nothing ever got released because nothing was ever finished. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's part of the re reason why I started making music myself, because I don't have that attitude. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I really follow was it uh, Tony Visconti's rule. Right. Because a lot of the stuff he did with Bowie, Bowie, of course, wanted, you know, multi-track. He, he, he heard music in multi-track, I'm sure. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times they, they weren't in studios or this, the studios during the time where they were doing a lot of their best recording they they weren't the 64 to infinity that we have yeah. now. Right. They, they were much, much more limited. So they had to do a lot of bouncing mm -hmm. tracks and stuff like that. And what he said once is that when they found something they liked, they just locked it in and then mm -hmm. they'd play something over it because they had to share in the track and then they couldn't change it. Yeah. And, that makes sense. Uh, it does because I, and, and I followed that as a rule because, you know, it's like Bowie, I think also he only he only liked to take one or two uh, uh, vocals, like mm. takes of the vocals. He did not like doing them over and over again. Yeah. And I mean, oftentimes he just nailed it the first time. Right. Yeah, sure. So, you know, it's a, he was a sort of exceptional. Per but you can hear that in the vocals. I think there's a special quality to vocals that are being sung for the first time, if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's that freshness. There's that, un, you know. It, it you know it's it's almost like improvisation sometimes because I know myself I've I've sung vocals and I've had an idea and then you're in the middle of singing it and you get another idea and you just go with it mm -hmm. and the track then is there and it, it sort of locks itself in yeah and it, sometimes you change the song because of that but but that's the it's the inspiration of music right oh yeah definitely. I'm, always looking, I'm always looking for mistake i'm looking for mistakes i'm looking for something that that stands out to the ear yeah, yeah and yeah, you yeah. have to hone in on that when you're writing music right yeah 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 i mean it definitely allows the music to come alive too yeah i'm a huge fan of of brian eno generally Me uh, too. but i i love his um oblique strategies concept of mm -hmm. just all right you know what if you feel things are getting stale, here's a deck of cards with just a bunch of suggestions on them. Everyone switch instruments, you know, something like mm -hmm. that. Like, let's just just screw with the formula in a way that's going to bring things back to life. Yeah. Yeah, he made a, a great album uh, using that method with uh, the, the band James. Oh, OK. I don't know if you've ever heard it. I uh, I can't remember the title of it, but they, they were having they're going through all kinds of problems in the band. Mm hmm. And uh, they ended up setting the recording studio. They were, I would, I think, in one of those country, you know, those one in the country estates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, there were two studios. So uh, he, he got the different parts working in different studios, playing uh, not their own instruments and all this, and then started bringing it back together again and whatever. And, and there, you know, it was interesting because I think a lot of the blocks and a lot of the issues they had sort of got worked out mm. so it was sort of like a musical psychologist okay <laughs> you know yeah yeah but but it it was interesting because it was using those kind of sort of out of the box thinking methods that that made it a really interesting record oh yeah exactly. as a producer brian eno is all I, I like him as a producer almost as much as every you know every other aspect of his of his career right mm -hmm. oh, and yeah, that's coming yeah. from like a you know roxy music fanatic Okay. And, you know, I would say Roxy Music and David Bowie are also two things that are kind of weaving their way in and out of our, uh, of the Star Crumbles kind of mentality, yes. our approach mm -hmm. to music. Yeah. So uh, what, 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 what would you say, where would you come down? Uh, so the, the first two Roxy Music that for me are the, the best two records, although you can argue a few of the later ones are pretty good too. Uh, where where do you come down between Roxy Music and For Your Pleasure? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking the the first one. Uh -huh. um, I don't good know. Answer. What's that? <laughs> That's like a good answer. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the first I one's after, a spectacular record. I, I think part of the issue, though, and and it is true with a lot of bands becoming kind of self conscious mm. of, okay, now we've done this, and now we're going to everything else is defined by that first one, yeah. you know? And so, um, and especially I think with, with Brian Ferry in particular, this sense of, all right, how are we going to, how are we going to make this into this formula of who we are? Yes. If that makes sense. Oh no, it definitely does. And it's definitely his album, uh, which is part of the, the whole issue around, you know, Brian Eno and, and his, his short tenure in the band. And he wasn't really a member at first, Mm -hmm. You know, he was he was more like a technician. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That then, you know, 
got on stage somehow and then managed to upstage Brian Ferry. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, right. Is, and probably got laid more, which is probably why you left, had to leave the band. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, I think, yeah. And it's just like, Hey, what's this guy doing up there with this weird machine with the joystick? And you know, it's just kind exactly. of exactly. And the boa feathers. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it, it's a really fascinating thing, but I think as well, like for your pleasure is much more experimental mm -hmm. and some of the songs are just you know absolutely fantastic and and you know, you hear little bits of it over like after it's it's more influential than most people will admit yeah, yeah, they, yeah they did so many things that then became popular mm -hmm. you know when you put them in context right you know they sound like they they they, they were recording in the 1980s and they're really like recording 1971 Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is which is it's like they're so far out of anything else happening at that time, and so fully formed. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I, I think part of that as well is just it's that first record phenomenon. Oh yeah, because yeah. Brian Ferry had a lot of time to write those songs. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and they're very good songs, right? Oh and yeah, then well, put, and then he put together the perfect complement. You know, the, the, with the craziest, I mean, they could jam, which is the weirdest thing because it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. the craziest jam band I've ever seen. Right. right. <laughs> when you really think about it. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was only because they had such great musicians. Right. Definitely. That, that were such con counterpoints to each other. And it's just like, you know, like if I had one musical wish, it would be I'd love to have my my Andy McKay. Sure. Yeah. yeah because yeah, he yeah. brought so much to that band. Mm -hmm. in terms of their sound because he was just so versatile yeah as, yeah, as like a horn player mm -hmm. uh and 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 that and those are the per perfect counterpoint to guitars for rock music right oh yeah definitely but, but almost no one has a competency to play them well yeah yeah you know yeah, yeah. uh anyway that's a bit of a tangent but no, uh no. But I, I like what you said though about i mean they sound yeah if you just played a record it would sound like it was from the 80s but I think that also speaks to how influential they were to all those bands that came out in the early 80s. Yeah. You know, even 90s. I mean, just, I mean they, they, they were just like way ahead of their time. time, you know? Yeah. And that's putting it into context of great stuff because, that they, you know, when that was coming out, they were in the same bar scene as, you know, sort of Tyrannosaurus Rex, mm -hmm. early David Bowie, like mm -hmm. before Ziggy Stardust. Right. When they were playing around, uh, you know, doing the, the Man Who Sold the World. Right. Yeah. 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 Which is a great record, you know. Oh yeah, but it but it's sort of it's a hard rock record, weirdly Definitely. enough, with all this other crazy Bowie stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and 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 that that was the thing that was more the style of music, right? Oh yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah, like yeah. it's like Bowie at the time could have backed up Queen easily. They were also in the scene, and they were just a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. and, and then you had Roxy music, yeah, which is like what what is this <laughs> you know and, yeah and yeah, all yeah. these costumes and personas right yeah yeah they were, exactly. like, they were like kiss almost all that was missing was the face makeup right yeah 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 in a weird sort of way right and you had like right, yeah, suave like... debonair you know brian ferry mm -hmm. with the weirdest voice in music mm -hmm. uh great voice but there's no one who sounds like he does yeah you, yeah, you know yeah. uh you know manzanera on guitar with those mm -hmm. bug glasses the whole yeah, time yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, looking absolutely insane, you know, and 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 then Eno in back twiddling things and you're wondering what the hell is this and making yeah. these weird sounds and a lot of sound effects, uh, which is also, I mean, that didn't become popular until what, the 90s around the turn, you know, to the yeah, yeah. 21st century, right? Mm -hmm. You know, anyway. So, so what other, uh, I'm just trying to think what other influences there are that really, uh, really do it for you that, you know, keep you, keep you so busy in music. Yeah. I mean, I think part of it is one of the, one of the biggest just psychological influences for me is, is just, I can't sit still, you know, um, <laughs> I get so bored and I would also say, I, I probably have a bit of, you know, ADHD, uh, where it's just, if I'm, I can I can really get into a book that I'm reading, but yep. it has to be a very good book. You know, it has to be about, you know, one of my favorite bands or something. You know, it has to be along those lines. Uh, otherwise, if I'm just sitting there, I can't I can't really sit down and say watch TV or something. You know, yeah. I, I I have to 
five minutes in, I just start getting itchy and I'm just, I need to start working on something. And yeah. sometimes that something is, Hey, let me reach out to this band. I like, I want to, I have some questions for them and see if they're interested in being interviewed on my blog. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, you know what, I'm going to record some music. That's what yeah. I'll do. Other times it's, Hey, I have this cool idea for uh, a movie I want to make. Maybe I could reach out to some people who are involved in something like that. Mm -hmm. Other times it's painting or learning how to make um, silk screen prints, you know, yep. whatever it is, it's usually mm -hmm. something that is expressive in some way, yep. uh, you know, playing with Photoshop, doing cool video stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's always this sense of let me, let me try to make something that I haven't seen before, you know, something that's kind of cool and different that other people might say, ah, hey, that's cool and different. Yeah, they might never look at it again, but at least they'll have to admit, yeah, I've never seen that before. <laughs> no, no, I, I think I think that that's uh, it's a great attitude, and, and also it, it's things that all sort of intertwine, right? Mm -hmm. Because oh, being yeah. able to do video is a good skill to help promote your music, and you know, and and I, I think as well, getting more active within the musical scene never oh, yeah. never hurts you know, your, your own music. I've seen in, in terms of myself, you know, the number of people that are following me and, and songs that I'm no longer promoting that other people have started promoting because they like them so much. And it's just like, you know, but, but that only happens as you become more, people become more aware of you. Yeah. Because there's just so much, you know, noise basically. Right. Oh yeah. And, and that's think, the biggest thing we're fighting against. Yeah. It's, it's, it's it's the idea yeah there are just so so many people involved yeah. in making so many different kinds of music and i think for me um i mean it's it's so i often try to think you know what is what is it that i want you know mm -hmm. i can't even really answer that question for myself why do i put this music out you know i'm not i'm not thinking like oh gosh i want you know a thousand five thousand i don't know, whatever some weird number of fans you know it's mm -hmm. it's it's what I often come back to is I liken it to being, imagine you have a hobby. Imagine you, you're really into electric trains, yeah. right? And you build this really cool electric train set. You want to show it to other people who really like electric trains, you know? It's, so it's just like, all right, yeah, you know what? How do, I, how do I find the other people who like electric trains? How do I find the other people who are into this thing I'm into, who will be as excited about it as I am? And then they can show me their cool electric train mm -hmm. and I could go to their house yeah. virtually perhaps. And we can just kind of be like, oh my God, yours is awesome too. This is great. I love it. And I feel like that's, that is what I want most, both in terms of why I make music, but yeah. also why I listen to music. It's that connection that you make with other people. Yeah. No, which, which makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, just, just as, I mean, I always think for me, if you only create the music and you don't promote it as well, like mm -hmm. you make no effort, the, the problem is, is it's, it's missing half the story, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, you're, you, I like the analogy of, of the trains, but as a musician, part of the thing is being in front of people. Yeah. You know, and then feeding off an, an audience and, and thank God that's a, you know, we're able to do that again. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like, I think my next big musical project after I complete my next album, I think is I'm, I'm going to uh, buy a guitar and start learning guitar. Oh, OK. OK. It's a fun <laughs> instrument. Yeah. Well, I, it also I'll be able to accompany myself on it. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of like the idea of that because, you know, if everything else goes wrong, I can always try to support myself busking. You know, yeah. so it's, like a, it's like a plan D or something like that. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know. hey, even when the power goes out, if you have an acoustic, you're good. Well, and that and that's the other thing or or an electric if you're really quiet. Right. Yeah. Uh, but no, well, I, I think, you know, I think as well, I, I, I really I like the idea of, of every album being different. Oh, yeah, definitely. It, it's like it's like really, really funny because you uh, I, I produced all this stuff that I never released as a record, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I was just listening to it recently and I'm sort of debating whether or not I'm going to release that because the, my new record is taking more time than I thought it would and it sort mm -hmm. of changed direction a bit. 
And I thought before I go out, you know, before you rush things, mm -hmm. um, why not put other stuff into context? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and yeah. so I'm listening to it and it's much more, you know, like there was a few songs that I was trying to sort of sneak into the new record that probably don't belong there and, you know, yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. And, you know, because it's, it's a bit of a, a stylistic difference and then some really old stuff. And so I sort of think, well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do one new song that'll sort of try to tie it all together mm. and put that out like in, yeah, the, yeah. in the interim, right. While, while I'm working on the other, the other project. Uh, but yeah, it's, I don't know. I don't have ADHD and I, I have the same compulsion. Okay. And for me, it's almost to the point that it's like, I want to get things out the door so I can do the next thing. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> Which is the craziest, you know, and it's like, uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm also going to work with a good friend of mine who's a photographer. Mm. And uh, I finally decided I'm going to do an ambient record with oh, him cool. where, you know, we're going to do it like, the, the photos to go with the songs and then have an exhibit and, you know, and have a CD with the, you know, the, the, the images and all that kind of thing. Yeah. And, and it's the funniest thing because I got into doing that because like you, I'm also into video and I've got a couple of video channels, you know, this mm -hmm. one included. Um, and I needed non copyright background music after mm -hmm. you run out of the three good songs and YouTube's, you know, free library. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just said, well, I'll give it a try. And, you know, and, and so I, I totally I, I love this because Brian Eno put out two ambient sort of generator programs for iPad. Oh, wow. Um, there's one I can't think of the, the, the names. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll put it down in the description if I remember. Anyway, they, he, he did them with this programmer and and the sounds and the the whole thing are very fantastic and they follow a lot of the the rules of ambient music right yeah yeah which yeah. is basically there should almost be some perceptible melody but if you go too far then it's a song and it's yes. not yeah, anymore, yeah. right mm -hmm. um so i'm using that to generate the music and then editing it and overdubbing it mm. and adding effects onto it Okay. And, and, you know, and that's how I'm doing, uh, I'm going to do the record. Yeah. Yeah. Very uh, good. So it's, it's really been a fun thing because I, I did a whole series of, uh, as well of these live ambient things. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, where right. I go out and use this program because it, it's really interesting. You, you have to intuitively know how to input to have it, you know, like it's a weird sort of almost garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. If you're if you're not very careful in how you manipulate the uh, the app, what'll end what it'll end up generating isn't really interesting music after a short time. Mm -hmm. So I I, I pay, played a lot of times around with that to try to okay. get it, but but then it's like a live performance. That's you know this is the one time, and I record it on video. Oh, okay, yeah, somewhere yeah. in nature, mm -hmm. right? So it's like a live out, outdoor, anyway. And that's yeah, that got me into that. And then I had, you know, you have the material and you reuse it. And now I'm going to do a record of it. Nice, because I, I I don't have, you know, I've got my one day off a week, and I figure, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you you got to use it wisely, huh? You got to use it wisely, exactly. And I don't have the luxury of like a whole summer off or anything like that. I know. Tell me about it. Yeah. So how much did you get, get done, you know, get done young, young man? Oh gosh. Uh, this summer. Um, let's see. So Brian and I recorded the album. Yep. I Coming out sure September, September 22nd, 22nd on Spotify, Bandcamp everywhere. Yeah. It'll be on all the, uh, all the, all the major streaming platforms, but also on Bandcamp as well. Okay. Excellent. And, uh, what, what's the title of it again? Uh, the title of the album is The Ghost of Dancing Slow. Perfect. And that comes from, actually, it's funny. There's a line in the song, Desperately Wanting, where mm -hmm. I thought Brian was singing The Ghost of Dancing Slow. And I thought that was the coolest line. And I was like, oh, this is this is a great line. And he said, oh, no. He said something like, oh, no, I was just singing The Ghosts Are Dancing Slow or something along those lines. I said, yeah. wow. And so then he kind of went back and changed the line of the song to the ghost of dancing slow. So now it's just, this is what it is based Perfect. on me mishearing something. 
Yeah. Uh, well, there, yeah, there are some classic mishearings, down. right, of lyrics. I'm sorry, what was that? There are some real classic mishearing of lyrics. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. So we're definitely in that tradition. <laughs> no, it's uh, a, So, yeah, so Brian and I recorded the album. Yeah. We made the documentary. That's also officially out on September 22nd as well. Right. Uh, but if you go to the starcrumbles.com and click on the big Star Crumbles logo, who knows what could happen? You might find a movie. Exactly. Um, and then earlier in the summer, I actually um, wrote and illustrated a children's book. You got and me beat there. It's called uh, Frankie Lumlet's Drank Janky Drum Kit. And it's about a little boy who wants to learn how to play drums, but his parents won't buy him a set. So he builds it out of just household items he finds in the recycling bin, basically. Yeah. So that is... I can see that being real popular with parents. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let me just, like, make some noise. But I think... Exactly, you know, yeah. To me, that's where you start... A little, little, little rebel I, crap. I think about when I was really, really young, before I even picked up an instrument... I have this really distinct, weird memory of uh, the vacuum cleaner would be running. And I would realize that like if I cup my ears over my my hands over my ears yeah, yeah, and yeah. like went back and forth, it changed the pitch. And then yeah. I would just start doing like this weird. Th and I just look like this like insane kid going like this. But I was just making these weird little melodies with like the pitch of the vacuum cleaner. So if you could start, you know, little kids just want to make noise they want to do things they want to yeah, they want uh, to be heard and i feel like if you can harness that and keep that creativity going and just kind of say yeah hey hey little kid keep doing that because that's where i feel like that's where people find real meaning in their lives you know as opposed to necessarily the more uh, i don't know stereotypical things you would imagine as you get older you're told okay the thing you have to do is get a job in finance and do whatever and make a lot of money and have a really nice house and car. Whereas, I mean, I've never had any of that stuff, but I, I don't imagine it would make me as happy or fulfilled as the creative pursuits that I get into. Yeah, no, no, definitely. I think, you know, uh, family sort of kids and, uh, and, a, and a hobby you really love. Yeah. No matter what it is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Just like commit to it and enjoy it, get really good at it, you know, whatever, yeah, yeah. whatever you define as good. Right. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah. And it, well, it's it's giving a point to life is what it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's yeah. a reason why you slog through the things you don't like doing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that means you get to do the things you do. Right. And whatever you do, don't call it a side hustle because then it becomes something you don't like doing. No, and, and someone's going to try to turn it into an app and then charge yeah. you a monthly fee. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so totally. stay away from that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so it was funny when you were talking about the, you know, the, 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 the little kid setting up the drum kits. I thought that would be a great start for a song. Get a little oh, yeah. toddler pulling like, you know, pulling a big pot out of the, the cupboard and then starting with the beat. Oh, yeah, yeah, that yeah. That yeah, becomes yeah. the beat for the song. I think that right, would absolutely right. work. That would be so cool. That would. You know, so free idea. Oh, <laughs> <You know? laughs> keep it in mind. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I've sworn off making videos unless I can do them as, you know, quickly and easily as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because otherwise it just takes too much, too much effort. Right. And I, I'd prefer spending that on doing something like a documentary that I find much more fun. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, it's, I a have different, it's a different sort of way of, of being creative. And it, it, you know, it makes you use different muscles is probably mm -hmm. a good way to put it. Yeah. Uh, you know, learn new, n learn new skills and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, I do that all the time. The, the only problem is then I learn new skills and I forget the last set of new skills I learned. You know, <laughs> it's just, and then I go back to something. Wait, how did I do that? I was using yeah. Adobe After Effects. How did that? Wow, oh, man. Yeah, um, well, well that, that, listen, that's a problem problem with Adobe, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because right, they, right. they just have listitis, you know what I mean? Everything has to be a sublist of a sublist of a sub, you know, and it, at some point, 
Yeah. No one remembers how anything works. Right. Right. Exactly. If you got a really cool effect yeah. just last week, it was like, oh my God, how did I do that? It's all right. Well, that was lightning in a bottle, I guess. <laughs> no, well, listen, I, you know how I would solve that? I would just remember the term that I used when I was searching for the, the YouTube video. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> to show me how to do it. Right. Yes. And yeah, after yeah. five, six times, you, you tend to remember it's sort of like, you know, you're not falling off that bicycle so much. Yeah. So, right. 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 Exactly. But yeah. No, I, 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 I know what you mean with that. <laughs> yeah. But I usually well, try to take what I call like just the punk aesthetic. You know, it's. Yeah. All right. Take one. Is this that's pretty close to what I wanted. We'll go with that. Let's just be yeah, on the next thing. Exactly. Exactly. You don't even have that $50 for the worst studio, right? Right. Yes. You know, <laughs> you're recording, you're recording on, you know, on your sister's tape deck and you got to yeah. get it right. 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 Exactly. No, no, it's uh, no, I, but, but listen, in terms of, uh, I, I, you know, it's like getting back to what we we're talking about with spending too much time in the studio and getting too sort of Boston about things. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I don't know how long that first record took. I think he had to build the studio. He had to build the studio. It's like craft work. He had to build the studio first. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole, yeah, the whole nine yards, and then do everything himself. Exactly. Wiring, and you know, it's like five years later. Yeah. You can start recording. Right, right, right. And, and then you don't find a tape deck that's good enough, so you have to in invent a whole new technology or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's like you know what? There's there's such such a thing as the good enough mix. You know. Exactly. Can well, I, 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 a quick, quick enough mix, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I, I find, I find the magic will happen, and and you just have to capture it and then move on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, or yeah, in my I case, when I'm recording, usually the next problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know what? What's wrong with this song? Right. 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 So, so what way? What? What? What's your? Uh, how do you? How do you like to compose music? Do you have one style of doing it? Do you have like one method? Or do you I, play around uh, between different things? Yeah, I just start with just kind of, usually I just start playing guitar or bass and just start fooling around until I have a riff that just sounds like, oh, I like this, you yeah. know, and it just kind of, that sounds cool. And maybe that goes with this other riff I was working on yesterday. And yeah. I do a lot of recording. I mean, okay. I will have, you know, uh, I use reason for, as my DAW and yeah. I just, I'll just have that running, you know, and I'll just fool around for a couple hours playing with so sounds that I yeah. think sound cool and just kind of mm -hmm. mixing them together and say, okay, what if this comes and this comes and we go back to that. And eventually I have kind of the, the spine of a song. Yeah. And then I just start kind of building into that. And so maybe then I'll go play some drums and record those. Um, or I'll just start playing with synth sounds, you know, depending on whatever, whatever the song is evolving into. Mm -hmm. Um, and so really it's just a lot of improvisation until it starts to sound like a song. Yeah. yeah. And, and so like jamming with myself. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I, I do the same thing. I, I have that in my head is like, uh, although I'm doing it all myself, I don't know what I'm doing. All of the stuff is basically coming out of mach a machine. Mm -hmm. I, my, my aim is to try to make my music sound as live and as if it was played by musicians as possible. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's sort of always my, my aim. Yeah. I, I don't often achieve it, but that's part of what gives me my sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that experimenting <laughs> yeah. with and just kind of getting yeah. it like... How do but I but also having the vision, the vision of it, right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, you know? yeah. And mm -hmm. then not and not limiting yourself. Yeah. The so other thing so, I always so what, have, what was that? Oh, one? the other thing I always have in the back of my mind is I am a huge David Lynch fan, and in the the um, season three of Twin Peaks, the one that was on a few years ago on Showtime. They always end with. Good. A, um, I, I was I was a big fan, and I, I felt so burned at the end of it. It was like you know, uh, it was like uh, Game of Thrones for me. With with oh okay, and, and we, we were doing it. I I was watching it when it was when it was being broadcast. Oh yeah, yeah. In Canada, no, you have to realize it wasn't being broadcast in Canada. Oh okay. So we were we were pirating. I, I worked at a TV station, mm -hmm. and we had a satellite. 
And so some episodes weren't being played or anyway, it, it had a really sort of spotty, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, spotty broadcast in Canada. Oh, uh, interesting. And, and then we ended up, we ended up having a, a satellite dish and, and we, we got, uh, we, we were recording the actual broadcast that they were sending out to the stations. Oh, wow. <laughs> because they just, they, they, they did those unscrambled, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so you know, we, we we recorded them then on the Betamax, and then and then brought it down to a, you know, VHS, and hoped that we didn't get fired, basically. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's how big a fan I was, and then I yeah, got yeah. very disappointed. The ending was was not, and the movie didn't help any either. So was the last season any good? I loved it. I mean, okay. I, I think a lot of people would find it, and I think a lot of people did find it very kind of. Uh, off-putting or confusing in the sense that it's not it's not the kind of reunion show you might want if you kind of want traditional tv but if you like uh anything that kind of goes in a lot of really crazy directions mm -hmm. then like it's stupendous but the, the the cool thing that i loved about it was almost every episode ended with a musical performance mm. um in the 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 little club they have in, in the town of Twin Peaks and they call it the roadhouse. Yeah. And it, and they had amazing I mean, it was like, I mean, nine inch nails was performed. Um, let's see. Um, I mean, a band called the cactus blossoms. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, just like really cool music, but in my head, the sound I'm always going for is, Hey, would this sound cool? if a band played this at the roadhouse on twin peaks, like that's, that's kind of to me, the, the gold standard of, is this that's cool good. music? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I have a, a goal as well. Uh, although I haven't achieved it yet, but I have this, this idea for a musical style mm -hmm. and, and it, it's, it's still sort of, well, I haven't found the right musicians because it'll have to be played with a band mm. as, as opposed to, you know, my cobbled together techniques. Mm -hmm. But I really like this idea of, of sort of post-apocalyptic sort of country music. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like, like what, what would that sound like? Mm -hmm. Like, like what, what, what would the music sound like, you know, if it was, you know, the being done by musicians who were living in like the, that fallout game? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or whatever, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? Right, right. But just sort of that thing, like so completely, like what would be played in a bar there? Because there's going to be bars, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, They're, yeah. they're not going to be safe bars. Yeah, you know, you could you could get shot in that bar very easily, mm -hmm. or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there will be those bars, right? And it's sort of like I I want to I want to imagine what that kind of music is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah, I think there's. I want to be in that band. Okay, well, we'll talk afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm always looking to to do collaborations. But uh, no, because I, I I just you know, but but I think that's the weird thing about music. It's like. With the Ambient Project, um, it came about because of the name. You know, mm. like I got I got the idea of, of liminal. Okay. Uh, and mostly because of that Twitter. There's a really good Twitter uh, channel where they people just post liminal photos. Mm. Uh, you know, and then I I was speaking with a friend of mine who's a very good photographer, and we we got discussing well what is liminal in in photography. And, you know, and the interesting thing is where it's usually like, usually the photos are in situations, man-made environments type thing. Mm -hmm. But his first instinct was, well, the liminal in nature. And I thought, oh, that's interesting because I, I don't think nature is liminal, but he was right. Mm. But how do you define it? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's really interesting. So, I'm, you know, I'm going to write him some pieces and then let him take photos wow, and that's... just see how the thing develops. Yeah, 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 yeah. Plus, plus, it's a good way to actually have a record release party where people are likely to show up. Okay. It's also like an art exhibit, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, I like I like that aspect of it. You can do it in a cafe, and it's also, it's like ambient music, so it's meant to have people talk over it. Yes, yes. Right? Actually, so I you mean, don't I have do... that weird thing where you have, you're doing the, the that stilted performance. Yeah, right, right, right. You know, so, sort of thing where people are there for the, you know, the free canapes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> right. But anyway, I, I think you'd probably sell some CDs too because you'd have nice photos and, you know. Yeah. I mean, I mean you always got to think of, you know, how do you get the merch out there? Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. how do you make a few cents so that you can spend some more money on equipment or, yeah, right. you know, or, or whatever. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, it's not, it's, we're not doing this for free, right? Well, yeah, uh, definitely. You know, we're, we're doing it definitely for love, but it's not for free. So, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I, have, I have nothing against people donating money to, to keep the cause going type thing. Oh, yeah. Why, yeah, why would I? You know, you want to charge at the door for a show, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. But anyway, so so listen, we just hit the hour mark. I'm going to ask you the last question that I always ask everyone. And please okay. answer honestly. So what was the first purchase of a, of a song? And mattering on your period, with me, it would have been a record or mm -hmm. a tape, a CD, or even a digital download might be acceptable mattering on what the song was. Uh, what was the first thing that you, you bought with your own money? I am going to say Magical Mystery Tour by the Beatles on CD. Um, it was the first CD I purchased. Yeah. And... What happened was I had just, it was one of those deals in the late 80s where they would say, if you buy a CD player, uh, you get three CDs for free. Okay. And, but it was a scam because it was like, no, really, we're just enrolling you in Columbia House. <laughs> yeah. And, but, you know, I was like, I don't know, 13 or I was like, ah, three CDs for free. That's amazing. And so I did, but then you had to wait because then they would mail it to you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it wasn't like Amazon where it would come like the day before you ordered it. Uh, it was like, it was like, oh, okay, order these three CDs, wait like eight to 10 weeks. So there I am with this CD player and no CD. So it was just like, oh, well, I love the Beatles. I guess, I guess it's going to be this one because I think I Am the Walrus is a cool song. So yeah. that's, that was my, uh, my first my first solo purchase of music. Wow. But you'd already been familiar with the Beatles because of the white album playing yes. in the yeah. car. Yeah. Yeah. And just, yeah. you know, tapes that, you know, uh -huh. I, I had from, I don't know, my family or whatnot, but yeah, that was the first time I was like, yes, I'm going to, this is an investment, which, which in the, in the eighties. So I guess that would have had to been 87, I think is when those were released. Yeah. That was, that was a significant investment for a 13 year old, you know? No, you were, you were talking maybe 10, $12, something like that. I don't know what the prices were like in the States, but in Canada, I think in the States it was, uh, it was closer to 15. Yeah. They were, they were up there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But no, it, it's an interesting choice too, because it's a bit of a disappointing Beatles record. Yeah. I mean, it's got some very good songs on it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. guess it matters also which version you had because different countries had different songs and different, you know. Right. Yeah. There were all these, you know, weird things about it. Uh, did the version you have have Strawberry Fields and uh, Penny Lane? Yes. As well, or, yeah. Okay. And then I can't even remember what the rest of it was. Yeah. I mean, it's. Um, it's like all you need is love. Basically, it's like they're singles from that era. Exactly. Plus exactly. the soundtrack to the yeah the TV special they did. Mm -hmm. But well, I mean, I am I am a walrus is a very interesting choice at that age. I think it, it probably says a lot about your your future in music. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? Yeah, if that's your favorite Beatles song at thirteen, you know, you you're you're on an interesting path. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's no, but it's a very it's a it's an interesting choice. Even though I, I would say, you know, in retrospect. Uh, it doesn't stand up against either like Revolver or Rubber Soul. Oh yeah, absolutely. That are probably my had, two favorite had, uh, Beatles records, right? Right, and I think part of it though was filling in blanks because I definitely had Revolver on like my mom's LP of it. Yes. You know, so I I could listen to that one in Rubber Soul as well. Uh, so it was, and and probably then now that you say that for good reason explains why no one in my family actually had magical mystery tour in any form. <laughs> you know, it's like, Oh, this is, this is the hole in the collection. I got to fill this in. Yeah. No, that's a good, that's a, uh, it's a good first choice. You're, you're definitely yeah. up there in the, uh, in the table in terms of, of best first records compared to what, what's the, the dross that some people uh, 
purchase. Although that, you know, that Columbia House membership really hangs over your head. So, oh, so yeah. what were the, did you get the actual three albums you ordered over Columbia House or did you end up with uh, three other albums that you had to mail back? No, uh, yeah, I got the, uh, I selected them. They allowed me to check the box. Yep. Yeah. And what, 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 what were those, what were those as a bonus? What's that? What, what, what were those three as a bonus? Oh, yeah. uh, Paul Simon's Graceland. Yeah. Uh, I love that one. That was a good I, album. I mean, that was the thing where I went from listening to Magical Mystery Tour to like only playing Graceland, even though I got World these two yeah. other CDs. It was like, that was, that was amazing to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was, and at the time I was just picking CDs based on like a name that I recognized, you know? So it was, all right, well, they only have one Rolling Stones CD and it's Rewind. Uh, which I don't, I think it might be a greatest hits package of 70s stuff. I, I mean, I, I'm not even sure what was on there, but mm -hmm. nothing on there I especially liked once it came. And the other one was Billy Joel, The Bridge, oh. which I, Time to Remember, I think, was my eighth grade graduation dance, like the, the theme song of that. Um, and that was on there. So I was like, I guess I'll get that one. But those two CDs, the Rolling Stones and Billy Joel, really didn't make it into my regular rotation, even even though my my entire catalog consisted of four CDs. It was really <laughs> yeah. going back and forth between Paul Simon and um, Magical Mystery Tour. Which are, yeah, out of all those, Paul Simon, Graceland's probably the best record. Oh, yeah, yeah. Easy. You know. Because he he did he did pull off uh, something similar to like Bowie with uh, Young Americans, mm -hmm. where he just went into an existing sound, yeah, and just like brought together all the best pieces. And he's a good songwriter, you know. Mm -hmm. You know he's a he's a brill. Well, not the brill building. It's whatever the other one was that took over from the brill building. Oh yeah, one yeah, of those. yeah. So he got into the business as a songwriter, right? Mm -hmm. You know, with his author yeah, 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 relationship yeah, yeah. with Art Garfunkel. Right. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I saw a really interesting documentary about that. Mm -hmm. Do you know, do you know the whole story of, of like they almost broke? Well, they broke up basically. Yeah. 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 And then their producer had this, this version of Bridge Under, uh, Bridge Over Troubled Waters. I think it was. It was just them singing and, and piano. And he then went into the studio without telling them added all the orchest or orchestration and you know arrangement and everything over it and it became a number one hit and paul simon who was over living in england at the time had to come back so that they could reform oh i'm yeah you know i'm thinking um <laughs> sounds of silence i think it was or sounds of silence like yeah you, you're right it was sounds they gave of it silence. they gave it that almost like a bird's kind of sound, right? Yeah. Because Which yeah, worked. Right. I mean, it, 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 it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. But, yeah, but they yeah, were yeah, like, yeah. they were sort of playing together as teenagers, right? Yeah. And they, under some other band name. I mean, they're a little bit, it's a similar story to, you know, Philadelphia's uh, Hall and Oates. I mean, they yeah, also yeah. were very young sort of musicians who got together early and were playing, you know, as teenagers and then got signed. Yeah. They played as Tom and Jerry. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's in, it's interesting, and I think at one point they totally hated one another, which is why Paul Simon was in England. Yeah, but then yeah, they come yeah. back because they'd actually broken massively big, right? Oh, yeah. uh, and then have the career that they had is quite fascinating. Oh, definitely, definitely. You know, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I have a lot of respect for Paul Simon. I have to say, oh yeah, the, the whole Chroma Chroma uh, Chroma ugh. Kodachrome. Kodachrome album is also just fantastic. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like all of his so solo stuff. Uh, but but he had the advantage of, you know, being an artist on one of the best labels for oh, sort yeah, of yeah. artists, you know, the sort of A&R side of things. Uh, could book all the best musicians, mm -hmm. including, it's interestingly enough, he, he did all kinds of sessions with the Mus Muscle Shoals boys too, didn't he? Yes, yes, he did. You know, so that's another great sound. And yeah. what a ba what a backing band that, right? Yeah, I you think know? if I remember correctly, it may be Muscle Shoals band uh, playing on 
the Kodachrome, Kodachrome, the song. Actually, it is Kodachrome because they have that song where they they, they originally took them in. Uh, they originally went into the studio to mm -hmm. do the, that New Orleans style number. Mm. And they they all, that's another song I think where all the band played each other's instruments. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They got, they got half drunk because, you know, uh, they were drinking beer waiting to, to start playing because okay. Paul Simon hadn't written the song yet. Oh, okay. Or something like that. It wasn't finished or whatever. So he was in the studio alone just figuring things out. And then mm -hmm. they came in, he taught it. It was very, you know. And uh, anyway, yeah, the, the, I love I love all these studio stories. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just so it's so interesting seeing the lore of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, also just how much the business has changed, unfortunately, mm. in, in some respects, because you don't get that, that kind of backing, uh, you know, mu musicianship that you did back then, if you could yeah. afford it, of course. Right. Right. But, you know, when you think of the number of of. of I mean, I wonder today in today's world with how sort of depleted and depressed the music industry is at like a major label. Yeah. How many how many actual studio musicians are really surviving these days? Uh, yeah. That and, and, is not, and not and not, you know, not being, uh, you know, sort of jobbing it. You yeah, know yeah. I mean? But are I actually mean, making really good money. Yeah. 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 That's I mean, we're under 70. Yeah, right. Are you going to get, uh, is there a modern day Hal Blaine? You know, I mean, Wrecking exactly. or yeah. the Funk Brothers from Motown or yeah. uh, Swampers from Muscle Shoals. You know, it's like, do, are there any studio bands that are just like, we know if we go to this studio, they have their in-house band, you yeah. could hire them and your record's going to sound amazing. You're hiring a hit, right? Yeah. yeah Basically, yeah, yeah. you know. And, and and they're good enough that you can have the bare bones of a song with something resembling a hook and they yeah. can turn it into a number one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's uh, a, a different world, but I really, I, I, I'd love, I'd love that because I've ever got, if I ever were to get successful, that's exactly how I do my next record. <laughs> 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 you know, and then, and then you're at, at the point where you have the bare bones idea and you let someone run with it. Yeah. You know, you know. Because that's always the way I, I, I've tried to, whenever I've been in a position where I've had to manage people, that's the way you manage them. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. You get them enthusiastic. You find the right person. Mm -hmm. You get them enthusiastic about it. And then you let them go. Right. I always say when I work with other musicians, yeah, I do exactly what you're saying, because the reason I'm working with them is I know the sound that I can make. I want a different sound. I want the sound you can make. I want you to do the thing that you do. So I always just feel like if I go in and they're playing something, I'm like, ah, no, 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 I want to, I want to uh, just do this a little bit. It's like, okay, now you're making the thing that I do. And I could have done that myself. <laughs> Excellent. Anyway, on that happy note, thank you so much for taking the time. One last time records out September 27th. September 22nd. Second. Yes. Almost. And what was uh, yes. name? Plug the name, plug the name again. The name of the album on September 22nd is The Ghost of Dancing Slow by The Star Crumbles. You can find us at thestarcrumbles.com. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. You take care. Thanks to everyone. Uh, please uh, subscribe, like, and all that stuff if you want this to continue. Talk to you later. Awesome. Bye. -bye.